Hello again, this is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. We're starting a little late because we're having some problems with the telephone lines. You know, we always talk about the gremlins get into our our programs sometimes, and they do cause problems. But um, they said they're going to see if their sound's going to be all right, and they may have to make some adjustments while we're on the air, but that's okay. All right, I don't know where the rest of you guys are, but where I am, it's very, very cold. We're really under a cold spell, and I'm sitting in front of a big fireplace <laughs> trying to get warm as we do this show. <laughs> and I know all of the eastern part of the United States are having a real bad cold spell, too. But tonight, I'm calling, our guest is clear across the other side of the world. We're talking to England. And I believe uh, you're in Exeter, aren't you? Yes, we are in the Exeter okay. area. And uh, this is uh, Stuart uh, Wilson and Joanna Prentice. And we're going to be trying to talk to both of them and see if we can get the sound to work. But I appreciate you doing this because I know in your part of the world it's 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I appreciate you staying up then to do the show. But... Um, let me give out the toll-free number first for anyone who wants to. Okay, they just interrupted to tell me they can't be any call-ins tonight because overseas we're using all the lines. So that means we won't have any callers. Callers, we will just talk all the way through. Now, before I bring Stuart and Joanna on, I do want to give a little background so the people will have an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, some of you who have heard my show, I've done it now for three years, and I've talked about my books on some of the shows, know that I've written the book Jesus and the Essenes. And we've mentioned that several times. And in that book, we do talk about Jesus' connection with the Essenes. And, you know, my work is all done with the, uh, the past life regressions, and that's how I got my information. And we found out that Jesus and John the Baptist were students with the Essenes back during that time. Now, some of you out there who don't know who the Essenes are, I just want to give a little bit on that before we bring in the guests, because they're going to expand on this. The Essenes were a mystery school that lived, well, they were around long before Jesus came along, but they were taught many mysteries that were not known at that time, hidden knowledge. And they were really um, founded by the survivors of Atlantis. That's how far back they go. And when we were having contact with them, they were at Qumran in Israel on the Dead Sea. And we found out that Jesus and John the Baptist were both students there, uh, and they were taught by them, and they were taught everything that the Essenes knew. Well, what I found out is uh, Stuart Wilson and Johanna, Joanna Prentice, they wrote a book that my, pu my company has published, and it's called The Essenes, Children of the Light. And actually, it takes the story further. We go expand upon what I found, and I think that's really interesting that we were able to get some more information. And one important point I want to bring out is that they said when they were getting this information, they had not even read my book, so they were not influenced in any way by it, but yet they expanded on it and verified a lot of the same information. This is what I've said time and time again on the show. If you can get the same information coming from several people, this adds validity to the information. Well, um, Stuart is the author of the book, and Joanna Prentice is the hypnotist. So she has done the same things by getting the information, by taking people into past lives. So, uh, guys, I just wanted to give that background because there are some people who may not even know what we were talking about if we start in. But uh, both of you are in Exeter, aren't you? Yes, in the Exeter area, in the west uh, part of England. That's right. 
Because you're on the west side. I know I've been out there. On, and on it the is west country. The country. Right? Yeah. Okay, and, and um, to me, your sound very soft. We'll have to see if they're going to adjust the sound yes. so we can all get at the same level here. Okay, we'll try and speak up a little too. Okay, all right. Well, before we get into the story, I want you to tell me some of your background each of one of you, so the people will know. I always like to start with people's lives and how they get into these kind of things. Who wants to go first? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll go first if you, if you like. All right. Uh, I, uh, I came from a fairly uh, conventional family. Uh, I uh, went to a conventional uh, public school in, in uh, Scotland and uh, I, I was in the Air Force doing national service. I, I did the conventional things, really, and then yeah. I went into uh, advertising for a while. I spent 20 years in advertising, and uh, then I, I left that And uh, because things were starting to move on into my life. I was starting to get interested in broadly what we would call the New Age. Yeah, and, uh, Sorry? Metaphysics, uh-huh. Yes, m metaphysics very, very broadly. And uh, I lived for a time, a couple of years, in a New Age center just outside of Exeter called the Beacon Center. And that's where I encountered uh, Joanna. And in 1990, I came to join her to uh, develop the Starlight Center here. She'd already set it up with her daughter, Titania, but uh, she wanted to develop it and move it on. And um, uh, a little while after 1990, she got involved in uh, the uh, process of past life regression. And perhaps I should hand over to her at this point and let her uh, tell her story as well. Okay. You can Hello, ahead. this is Jan Apprentice. Yeah, you... I was born in Bangalore in southern India. And when I was nearly three, my family returned to Scotland, where I spent my teenage years. After I left school, I traveled extensively, and I married, and I lived in Hong Kong for, actually, I think it was two and a half years, and then after we finished, he was in the army, after we finished in, in Hong Kong, we moved to Australia, um, south of Perth, Western Australia, and we had a farm in the bush, and that was where my three daughters were born. And it was while I was there that my interest in alternative medicine and education, organic farming, metaphysics, and meditation began. And I worked with homeopathy and uh, radionics. When I returned to the UK, I trained as a Montessori teacher and later educated my two youngest daughters at home for a few years. My daughter Titania now lives in America and... Katinka and Larissa in the southwest of England. I have two granddaughters and one grandson. I've done several healing courses and I have a foundation diploma in humanistic psychology. I also trained with Ursula Markham and have a diploma in hypnotherapy and past life therapy. I set up the Starlight Center in 1988 and it was a center for healing and expansion of consciousness. Tanya uh, has been back and living here, but um, during her time in America, she introduced us to many innovative techniques and interesting people, and she continues to do this. Uh, when I was working with Stuart and my other regression subjects for this book, I find it was the most experience, amazing experience I've ever had with any of my clients. The information just poured forth with, and was incredible, and the energies in the room were so blissful and powerful. Uh, the amazing happiness of being with Jesus was out of this world and breathtaking, but the sadness and confusion after the crucifixion was a complete contrast. Um, but the story was so amazing that we uh, made it, in, or wrote it as a, as a book, which then, as you know, when you came to visit our center, we gave you the manuscript and uh, you looked at it. Uh, yes, yeah. if I can uh, just add, Dolores, that basically what I've evolved into is uh, to be a writer on new perspectives. What fascinates me most is consciousness, how it changes, how it evolves, 
from lifetime to lifetime. And what actually causes that change? What triggers off a breakthrough, a process of transformation? Mm -hmm. Well, I remember whenever you gave me the manuscript, in the beginning, it needed a lot of work. That's true. No, that's absolutely true. And that's why we work together. And, you know, a lot of authors won't do the extra work. They just say, no, this is the way it is. Leave it alone. But you were open to suggestion, and it did turn into a wonderful book. And uh, the book is selling very well, and it's already translated into French and German. So it's getting out there. But uh, Mm. the one thing I wanted to bring out, that when you began to get the information, you know, Joanna, were you doing past life therapy as therapists, or what, when you first started on it, or what? Just regular past life regressions. I was doing past life regression before these subjects came to me that had a life with Jezio or Jesus. And I was doing it more as a healing technique because Uh I find a lot of people um, were having problems because of, of, of memories from past lives and I find and still do find it a very effective um, healing technique. And, you know, the information was was also excellent and and gave people a lot of insight. Well, whenever you found that you were doing regular past life regressions before the contact with Jesus, and that time period came out, weren't you? You were doing regular past life regressions before that? Yes, I was. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we had a series of different things, but one group that uh, came to us sort of spontaneously, uh, more, more or less at the same time that other people were, were um, doing regressions, we, we had uh, a time when the Cathars all came through, and that was just uh, before the people that had been, had a life with Jesuit. It, it was sort of almost like the call went out. I mean, they didn't know that other people were coming here to do Life with the Cathars or with Jesus. Uh huh. So, um, whenever you got the, well, that's why I wanted to make it clear to the listeners this information in the book, uh, The Essenes, uh, didn't come through one person. It came through several, didn't it? Oh, absolutely, yes. Mm, that, that's true. In fact, we had seven past life subjects on both book one and book two, but they were somewhat different. In in the first book there was basically a pair of friends Daniel and Joseph and there was another pair of friends Luke and uh, the Essene called the Silent One and then there were three individuals Martha and Essene uh, and Nikki and Carol who were followers of Jesus and those three individuals really had no connection that we could find so it was two pairs of friends and three individuals uh-huh. Um, for the second book, again, there were there were seven past life subjects, but they were they were rather different. There was only one pair of friends, and the others were all individuals. Okay, so they all came at different times, and when you when they all came at different times over a long uh, uh, time frame from about ninety one, ninety two, mm. Joe, somewhere around there, mm. uh, and uh, then obviously the. Uh, past life subjects for the second book came a lot later than that, so it was it was over a period of years certainly. And so, uh, Joanne was regressing each one. They found out their stories, but then you found out later uh, they were all what telling the same story from different. That, yes, that's yes, that's absolutely right. That uh, that really is what fascinated us. The stories started to merge and to overlap and we started to find connections between them Uh, and that's one reason why we felt we had to get the information out it didn't seem to be accidental to us that all these stories were uh, starting to merge in this way Uh, and the well the connection with my book was because uh, they were they were connected with the Essenes some of them were weren't they that's true yes Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, in, 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 in terms of the uh, uh, Daniel and Joseph, they, they were obviously a scenes. Luke and the Silent One were a scenes, and Martha was. The, the other two, Nikki and Carol, were simply followers of Jesus, uh-huh. uh, and they weren't connected with the Essenes uh, directly. And they seem to have all been at Qumran at the same time that the subjects in my book were. It Doesn't that sound right? 
Uh, yes, uh, yes, indeed, uh, they uh, they had incarnations about that uh, period. That's absolutely true. Their, their ages varied a bit, but they all seem to have been adults uh, around the time when Jeshua was um, um, uh, doing his 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 main ministry work there. Mm-hmm. So that's the important part that it is expanding on the story and giving more information. Hmm. Absolutely true. And another thing I found fascinating was in my book, we, we had mention of the Kalu, who were the more or less the founders of the Essenes, mm-hmm. way, way back, and they were connected with the Atlanteans. And here you also found the same name mentioned, didn't you, the same group? Absolutely true. The, the Essenes had a lot of dealings with the Kalu, and uh, through the Kalu, uh, they had some dealings as well with the Order of Melchizedek. So... In a sense, you could say the Melchizedeks were uh, the ultimate founders of the order, but they worked through the Kalu from day to day. The day to day contact with the Essenes seemed to have always been done through the Kalu. See, that was what fascinated me, because because you said you had not even read my books yet, but yet you were getting the same information. So yes, this, absolutely this has, right. We we, we were just uh, digging around, researching uh, in, in the same uh, site, if you like, at the same time period and, and the same area, and uh, we were digging up very much the uh, same research results. Yeah, so I said that adds validity to it, because neither one of us knew what we were doing there. We were just mm. acting as the reporters here. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely true. We were just reporting what happened, uh, what was there, uh, as it was reflected in the consciousness of people who are now living. Yeah. Also, uh, you came in contact with Joseph of Arimathea, too, didn't you? Oh, yes. Joseph was a fairly major uh, player. Um, his uh, friend Daniel that he, in fact, grew up with, they were about a year apart in age, their families uh, knew one another, he grew up with Daniel, uh, Daniel um, was a stay-at-home in comparison. Joseph made all these journeys because he had to go. He was um, uh, uh, the owner of a large number of tin mines in Cornwall. Uh, Cornwall was the main uh, source of tin at that time. So he made a lot of journeys by ship, and he would come back and tell Daniel how his journey had turned out, how good or bad it was. <laughs> and um, th- their friendship really was the core of the first book, the friendship of these two people, uh-huh. quite different people, but it was their uh, friendship was, that was really the, the core of the whole book. You see, there again, we had found the same information out about Joseph of Arimathea, because that's when I've told people, in the Bible, he's only mentioned the one time, mm. and it just that's says right. that he, the rich man that gave up his tomb, but in our world... Yes found he was much more than that. He was Jesus' uncle. And, uh, oh, yes, and when, uh, that's absolutely right, when uh, Joseph the carpenter died, in effect he became Jesus' guardian, he took over the uh, management of the family because uh, his sister Mary uh, uh, was obviously in a vulnerable position then, and it was very common that these were days of very high adult uh, mortality, and it was very common for one member of the family to take over uh, when another adult had died. So this was fully in line with their customs at the time. Uh, he uh, was very helpful in uh, arranging transport if Jesus wanted to go uh, to various locations. Uh, Joseph had a very large fleet of uh, commercial ships because he needed to transport the tin from Cornwall to various uh, ports for the uh, whole uh, Roman army. It was a a basic uh, military uh, requirement at that time. Uh, You needed tin in order to make bronze. The Roman army could not function without bronze. So uh, Joseph had a very large fleet of ships, and that helped in transporting not only Jesus, but also a number of Essenes where they wanted transport. And yeah, that's what we, I found out, too, that, Jesus, that Joseph was one of the richest men in the world at that time. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. The, the biblical reference to him uh, is very much an understatement. He was not only uh, an industrialist on the scale of Rockefeller. He owned most of the tin mines in Cornwall, which was the only major source of tin 
At that time, the mines in South America hadn't been discovered at that point. He was not only an industrialist, he was also, like Aristotle Onassis, a major ship owner. He had this enormous commercial fleet, which uh, took the uh, tin from Cornwall basically to wherever the Roman army needed it. Any Roman port that required tin, Joseph would supply it. And he had a remarkable reputation amongst the Romans. The Romans didn't think the Jews, on a whole, were very efficient. But Joseph was efficient. He, if he promised a delivery of tin to a certain port, then he delivered on that. Mm-hmm. And this was the way that Jesus um, went all over the world, too, in the missing years, because uh, he traveled with his uncle to these different places. Yes, absolutely right. The uh, shipping was available. Uh, they even, as we, we, we learned later on, they even had, when traveling uh, overland across Gaul, what is now France, they even uh, had a Roman escort because the Romans were interested in safeguarding their tin supplies. Mm-hmm. So you could go quite safely around the world of that time with Joseph simply because he had absolute backup from the Roman army. And it was like a, like a, a disguise that Jesus just went along with his uncle, like on the trips. They didn't really know he was going to be taught by the different uh, wisest people in the world mm. at that time, you know, keep, that he was actually going to these teachers, and Joseph was taking him to these places under yes. the guise of just going, uh, you know, on the trips with him. Mm. That's, That's what I it. Yes, it was, uh, it was a very convenient arrangement. It worked out very well. Yeah. But Jesus was actually taught by these people all over the world before he started his ministry. That's absolutely what? true. Uh, and, uh, for example, the uh, Druids uh, have been perhaps given a very bad press by the Romans who tried to make out they were absolute barbarians. In fact, they had a very sophisticated uh, culture in Britain at that time. They had uh, the equivalent of universities where people would spend up to 20 years uh, having a very thorough training, it was a completely oral tradition, so there was nothing written down. You had to memorize everything. That's why it took so long. It was a very thorough training, uh, but it was a very sophisticated training. And the Druids actually had uh, drew a lot of their information from Pythagorean teachings uh, from, from Greece. So it, 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 it was not a, a minor barbarian offshoot. It was very much part of the center of European culture at that time. Yeah, this is the same thing that I found also, that they were. It was like one of the largest universities in the the world at that time, and Mm. that they were not barbarians. They had a great deal of intelligence, and Jesus was taught by them. That's one of the... Oh, yes. Oh, he he got a great deal uh, from the wisdom traditions in various parts of the world, and... uh, that's something that's been underplayed, really. The early church fathers were really keen to promote the idea that Jesus needed no teaching, no training. He just arrived knowing everything. And it really was more complex than that. Yeah, that's what I've always said. They make it like he just appeared one day with all of this knowledge, being able to do all these miracles, not knowing yes. he had been trained and taught by the wisest people in the world. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, really the early church fathers wanted to Hellenize the original uh, Judaic side uh, of uh, Jesus, and uh, they they wanted to promote the idea that this was almost like mighty son of Zeus descends from the heavens and saves us all. Now, of course, the son of Zeus doesn't need any training, doesn't need any teaching, doesn't need any sport backup or anything else. Uh And it wasn't like that. It simply wasn't like that. Well, that's what I found. There's many, many stories that I think belong in the Bible because there were a lot of them were miracles, but they have been intentionally left out of the whole story of Jesus. And you found that yes, also. I think, in your yes, work, you found yes, the same I think thing. That, that, that's probably quite right. I think there was an adaptation of the teachings to make it uh, more impressive, more magical, more Hellenic. Uh, in order to strengthen the hand of the early church fathers. I don't entirely blame them for that. They were surrounded by uh, pagan religions that must have seemed very powerful and very threatening to them. They had to make sure that Christianity survived. 
You can't entirely blame them for trying to move it in a direction that they probably thought was safer. But in doing so, they actually came away from the Judaic roots, which uh, is really the source of everything that uh, Jesus taught. Mm -hmm. But there was really so much more to it. Do uh, you want to discuss the crucifixion? Because uh, your, your book, it takes it in a little different direction than most people know about it. And I don't know if you can explain it, but, the, you know, it is much more powerful what the Essenes, the role the Essenes had in the actual, not so much the crucifixion, but after the crucifixion. Do you want to just try to explain some of that? Uh, yes, that's, that's fine. But, uh, it, it was powerful. very much basically a team effort for which the Essenes had been preparing. They uh, knew uh, for a long time before that there would be some form of initiatory process. They might not have known precisely when it would occur. Their teacher of righteousness would arrive. There would be a process that needed a lot of help and support by them. They had set up what we would call uh, a ley line system, uh, with interlinking triangles to focus the energy to give support on the higher levels to Jesus when he was on the cross. They had uh, groups meditating in all the main Essene communities to feed in support on other levels. So the whole thing was a team effort. It was not a solo performance. It was a team effort. And I think that, that comes over very, very strongly in... Uh, the accounts that we, we found, that we started to open up, that it was uh, an effort on the, on the part of the entire uh, Essene Brotherhood, uh, Joseph uh, directing uh, members of the Essene brother, Brotherhood had very secretly uh, built a tunnel connecting his tomb, an underground tunnel, connecting the tomb to his house because all of that land uh, in Jerusalem belonged to him. Uh, he, he was a, a very rich man, as we've already said. He had lots of property. That was one of his properties. He made sure that uh, tunnel was available so that, in effect, they could uh, carry uh, Jesus after the crucifixion when he was um, being revived and healed in the tomb. He could be carried down the tunnel into Joseph's house and make good his escape because uh, he was a marked man from that time on. Had the Pharisees discovered that he did indeed survive, uh, there would have been uh, soldiers going out on, on, on the behalf of the uh, Pharisees and the high priest of the temple in Jerusalem to make sure he did not survive very long beyond that point. Mm -hmm. And I believe he said in the book, too, that when all this was going on, Jesus was in a very weakened condition. He really yes. had come very close to death, didn't he? Indeed, very close indeed. I think it was uh, a very near thing. He was obviously very, very strong, not only physically he had trained himself, but mentally he was strong on all levels, and that did help. But it's still a very major uh, thing. He was not on the cross as long as uh, many of um, uh, the people who were crucified were, simply because he had to be taken down before the Sabbath be uh, began. Yes. Uh, so uh, that limited the amount of time he was on the cross, but it, it's still a very, very major impact on a physical body. Uh, he had an enormous amount of healing by healers, who again were brought in through this underground passage from Joseph Ramathia's house, along the tunnel, into the uh, tomb, and uh, a healing process uh, occurred in the tomb. And actually we have, interestingly enough, in the second book, we got much more information from uh, um, uh, Laura Clare, the uh, sister of Jeshua, who played a major role in the healing process because she was, in effect, the, the herbal expert who looked after that uh, particular aspect of healing, although there were other healers who, uh, like Luke, was very highly skilled in crystals, and that was another aspect of the healing process in the tomb. And also the Essenes were trained in healing. and But they had to keep their part in all of this uh, very secret so that no one would know what they were doing. Like you said, before the, you know, from the crucifixion and they were meditating and uh, all of them in the network, it all had to be very secret. Oh, extremely secret. And uh, the fact they had um, 
built a complete ley line system with triangles over a long period of time, uh, something like 150 BC when the first Essene communities were set up on the direction of the Kalu, and even in the very early stages of the Essene communities being set up, they realized they had to give priority to developing this energy system. So they were working in terms of decades, if not hundreds of years. The Pharisees were working in terms of day to day. And if you work in terms of decades, you can always keep, keep a step ahead of the people who are just thinking from day to day. So there's a whole, there's a whole other, uh, let me say, stories or group of information that the average person, no matter how many years they've gone to church and studied the Bible, there's a whole lot of information they don't have access to. Mm. And I think this is important that this is getting out. But let's talk about Mary Magdalene, too, because we oh, yes. also found the same information on her. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the church wanted to, I think they talked about her being a prostitute, and they tried to play her down, it's just like they did the Druids. Oh, yes. Without realizing the power that she did have. Now, the second mm -hmm. book that... Uh, Stuart Wilson and Johanna Prentice have written, and it, we just published it, it just came out, is called The Power of the Magdala. And Mary Magdalene is mentioned in the first book, but she's also more or less like the center figure in the second book, isn't she? She is. But one thing I think is that I found also is that the other disciples were jealous of her because she was not a prostitute. She was actually an Egyptian priestess, she had a tremendous amount of training and knowledge. That's what yes, that, yeah. that, that's certainly true. I mean, she had had an extensive training. Um, the, uh, there was a problem with that. A lot of that training occurred in the Temple of Isis at Alexandria in Egypt. And to become a priestess, in fact, she was not only a priestess, she was a high priestess of Isis was a wonderful thing, and it established her in a very strong uh, wisdom tradition with a, a very extensive lineage into the past. The problem was the conventional Jews didn't accept that, and they were very negative about it. A priestess of an alien, heathen cult would not go down well with the average Pharisee. <laughs> they would be deeply, <laughs> deeply suspicious of that. And I think it created problems for Mary. Over a, long, over a long period of time. Uh, she was a very powerful and empowered woman with drawing upon a very deep wisdom tradition. Uh, but she had her training in Egypt and not in Israel. That was the problem. And also the other disciples, being men, were jealous of her, because, especially yeah. her association with Jesus, because what I've heard that, that she could he could talk to her because she understood metaphysics. Yes. And they were jealous of this relationship because they were they were able to have had so much in common. But yes, was, it, was it Peter or Paul that was the most jealous? It was Peter. Paul, Paul really uh, wasn't involved in the early group around uh, Jesus. He, he uh, didn't know Jesus before the uh, crucifixion. He uh, came latterly on the scene. It was Peter, you're quite right, it was Peter. Uh, Peter apparently had, uh, there's evidence that he had difficulties in dealing with the Indian empowered woman. He had real difficulties with Helena Salome, who was the sister of Mother Mary. Uh, he had major problems with Mary Magdalene from the very beginning. Uh, her free and powerful expression of opinion, which might have seemed uh, frank and engaging in a man, just grated on Peter's patriarchal nerves. He just could not take that, and he would um, uh, criticize uh, uh, Mary Magdalene quite a lot. He uh, didn't do that with Mary Anna, Mother Mary. Uh, she was a very empowered being with a very determined look on, on her face, uh, particularly through, through the eyes, and uh, she was a generation older. Uh, she was a matriarch figure. Um, uh, and at one stage in the book we say one look from those eyes would have silenced him. He, he would not question Mother <laughs> Mary. But Mary Magdalene, uh, he resented, he deeply resented her closeness to uh, Jesus. He uh, wanted to promote the interests of the male disciples and diminish the importance of the women. And I think above all he just could not bear the thought that Jesus could be telling Mary Magdalene things that he 
the obvious leader in his eyes, at least of the male disciples, needed to know. He wanted to be the top of this tree, and Mary was inconvenient, and she was just in the way. Yeah, and he was sharing things with her that uh, he didn't share with Peter. Yes. But one of the things that I, I found in my work, too, and that's why I really like about the second book, Power of the Magdala, is that Jesus did have many, many women disciples. And this has been totally ignored by the church. They have taken all reference to them out altogether. But I found that women followers could understand uh, what he was trying to teach easier than men could. Because, you know, women are more intuitive. But mm -hmm. let's talk about the women disciples, because you found, what did you find, 12 or 13? Uh, 12, uh, we've got a list of the uh, first circle of 12, uh -huh. uh, headed up uh, by Mother Mary, uh, Mary Anna, uh, uh, and her second in command, if you like, was Mary Magdalene. Uh, and then there was uh, Helena Salome, uh, who was the sister of Mary Anna. Uh, Helena married Lazarus, also called Zebedee, and their sons were John and James, who were also disciples, of course. Uh, then there was uh, another sister of Mother Mary called Mary Jacoby. Uh, she married uh, Cleophas, and their daughter Abigail was a disciple. Uh, Abigail married the disciple John. And then there was Martha of Bethany, uh, who was a disciple, uh, the sister of Lazarus and um, Martha's sister Mary was a disciple too. Uh, then uh, Mary uh, Anna had a sister called Rebecca, and her daughter Miriam Joanna was a disciple, and um, Mary Anna's brother Isaac had a daughter called Sarah, uh, and she was a disciple. Um, Laura Clare, um, and we have a whole chapter about Laura Clare in the second book, uh, she was also called Ruth, and uh, she was a sister of uh, uh, Jesus. She was a disciple. Um, and uh, Lois Salome, uh, a daughter of Joseph of Arimathea, was a disciple. There was another daughter of Joseph called Susanna Mary. So that's, that's the full list of 12. There, there are 12 led by Mother Mary, uh, whose full name was Mary Anna, and Mary Magdalene. So it was a very substantial list. Uh, and uh, closely related to uh, Jesus, unlike the uh, group of male disciples who came from all over Israel. Mm -hmm. So there were 12 men, and there were also the 12 women. But uh, did yes, they... in, in, in the first circle, but uh, there were six circles of 12. So there were 72 male disciples and six circles of 12, making 72 female disciples. In other words, 144 disciples in all. These have largely been neglected, forgotten, written out of the record. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of disciples there. There were. That's and what I've said. There were, always, there were a lot more followers than people. Oh, a lot more. A lot more. Um, however, this, this idea that there were female disciples did not suit the early church fathers. <laughs> they didn't want that. Definitely. So it seemed uh, to be all done by these 12 men who were doing everything. And I'm afraid it isn't so. That's what always gets me, because the church is always saying a woman can't be a priest because Jesus didn't yes. have any women followers or disciples. They're totally wrong. Yes, they, they are totally wrong. This is a lively issue even to this very day. The worldwide Anglican church is considering going from, they have priests already, they're considering going to, to bishops, but one of the argument that's always trotted out against that was there were no women disciples, therefore it's impossible for a woman to, to be a bishop. And it, it's, the whole thing is, is simply not founded on fact. Uh-huh. So, hmm. Okay, but the women disciples and the men, did they mix together, or were they two totally separate? Did they keep separate uh, under themselves? You know, the women... Uh, they had their own uh, councils, if, if you like, and uh, met uh, separately, but they also worked together. They, they would send out groups of uh, male and female disciples together, uh, partly for protection for the women, but also partly that they could uh, do work. If they went around the villages, there was work that the women could do that the men couldn't do. 
Uh-huh. So it was, uh, it, it, uh, this was fully in the tradition of the Essenes who practiced complete equality. This was not quite the same thing with the Pharisees and Sadducees who lived a much more highly structured and very traditional family life with uh, the uh, man really being seen to make all the major decisions outside the family. Inside the family, the mother might be a very strong influence indeed. But outside the family, the man was seen to be the main source of all decision-making. Yeah, that's mainly because in those days, women weren't taught anything. Only the, the boys were yeah, in school. Yes, the boys were the only ones that, that were uh, taught anything because they figured all a woman had to do was be a wife and a mother. Mm-hmm. So that was yes, that's, really... That's, out of, that's out of, true. Uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, uh, Jewish society is still patriarchal today. 2,000 years ago, it was even more patriarchal. And there was all sorts of protocols. When a, a man went away and came back to uh, his home, the wife wasn't allowed to rush out and greet him. She had to send a messenger. There was dialogue between, at a distance between the, the returning husband and the wife. And it was all governed by protocol. This is, this, this is the lives of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Essenes didn't believe in that. They lived in a much more simple way, a much more direct way. We would say a much more democratic and modern way. Yep, but yep. that was one reason why they were deeply resented by the Pharisees. The Pharisees felt the Essenes were undermining the old traditions uh, that had uh, dominated Judaic society for so long. Yeah, that's what I found. That was one of the reasons why Jesus treated women differently, was because mm. the Essenes treated women as equals. Absolutely as equals. And there were some of the major teachers in Qumran, the head teacher on the mysteries, was a woman. She was just the best teacher for the job. She, she, she did that job superbly. And there were, throughout the Essene communities, there was uh, quite a number of very powerful and very effective women teachers. And see, that was another amazing thing, is that we found the same names for the teachers in, in my book and your book also, mm-hmm. the ones, especially right. the teacher of the mysteries. So here again, I know we're getting the same information. Mm, that's right. But in my book, They Walk with Jesus, uh, when Jesus went to the villages of the lepers to heal, he had women, that followers, that do herbs, they knew how to do dressings and bandages. Mm-hmm. So they all had their own thing to do. He had men Absolutely. that would do the carpentry work and things like that for the uh, the lepers. So they each one had their own job. Mm-hmm. So that's what I found the same thing, that he did have women with him. Yeah. So I think this is important information that does need to get out because it's all been suppressed for too many years. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing we have to get it in this way. It shows nothing is ever lost. Every life you ever lived, it's still there. You just have to uncover it. No, I, I agree with you completely. And it's very difficult to get a complete picture just doing it from the archaeological record. Uh, you might think, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls represents the totality of what the Essenes were studying. In fact, this was just the unimportant documents that they had a lot of copies of and they didn't bother to take away. And they just stored it in the cave thinking they would probably come back for it. But they had a a wide range of of scrolls and documents from all over the the, uh, Middle Eastern area at that time. They had Pythagorean material uh, from uh, Greece. They had Zoroastrian materials from uh, Persia. They had lots of very interesting uh, mystery school information from Egypt. But these were the more dangerous documents. These were the documents that would be a hazard to the life of any Essene if the Pharisees had caught them with them. So these documents were, were, uh, were got out of Israel very quickly after the crucifixion. Uh, they uh, were taken to Alexandria. They were taken up to Damascus. They were just moved uh, out of Israel, and the uh, few remaining uh, duplicate documents that they had lots of copies, uh, they, they, they were found, they, they were left behind in the caves and found at Qumran, but not the really important material. That was moved out long before that. Yeah, because when they found them, the, uh, the scrolls in the caves, some were in the clay jars, but other ones were mm-hmm. just scattered around the caves. 
and they had mm-hmm. to piece these together, and they're still piecing them together. So you think those mm-hmm. are the ones that were just common knowledge then? They were. They had a lot of duplicates, of, because there was an intense operation of copying. Qumran had a big uh, uh, copying operation where documents that were considered to uh, be worthy of big circulation were copied to go to uh, sometimes various other um, Essene communities. So, uh, yes, it was uh, a fairly major operation, and that, that's why duplicates of these things turned up. Yeah, that's what I found, too. It was like a publishing company, and they made mm-hmm. copies, and they sent them by the caravans that came around the Dead Sea. The caravans would come to gather salt at the Dead Sea, mm-hmm. and they used the caravans to carry the scrolls to other communities. So they had that's quite, right. quite an operation set up there. <laughs> oh, it was quite an operation. And, of course, as you say, all this had to be done very secretly. Uh, at one stage in the first book, Daniel says, we can see a day coming when the secrecy that has served us so well will no longer be needed. And the true story of our teacher of righteousness and those who helped and supported his work can be told. So they they had a different uh, uh, scale of priority, really. From the point of the uh, crucifixion, uh, they started, the seen Brotherhood as a whole started to look to the future, and uh, that is why Daniel was able to uh, tune into that uh, collective consciousness, if you like, of the Essene Brotherhood, and there was an awareness that the communities might not long survive. They simply had too much opposition amongst the Pharisees and Sadducees, and because there was that awareness, they were open to the idea of dialoguing with other groups such as our own. We're not the only group by any means. But they they felt that it was important that their story should be fairly told and uh, the story should not uh, be distorted uh, simply because the Essene communities were no longer there. That was the problem. They couldn't foresee that it would be distorted by the church fathers that came later. No, uh, absolutely. And... Uh, As I say, the Church Fathers had their own agenda. It was a highly patriarchal agenda. They they didn't want uh, empowered women, uh, and they they had real uh, problems with uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, and uh, they 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 disliked intensely the idea uh, that um, uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene could be in a complete partnership. Uh, that was anathema to the early church fathers. They wanted to isolate Jesus so that he was uh, completely uh, seen to be uh, a, a sole operator, perhaps having disciples, that's absolutely true, but no close connection uh, with any woman, and particularly with a woman like Mary Magdalene, who had had a past which included uh, training in the Isis Temple of Alexandria. Uh, all that was uh, not what the church fathers wanted to uh, promote. Uh, they wanted to promote Jesus as a as a, a remote magical figure uh, who uh, they could um, uh, build a religion around. And to be absolutely fair to them, they felt very threatened by the strong pagan religions of that time and felt they had to increase the power of Christianity uh, in order to ensure its survival. And they had to include, really, some pagan uh, parts into it in order to make it survive. You know, so no, that that's was... absolutely true. Uh, there, there were no extensive ceremonies in the very earliest years of Christianity. The ceremonies, uh, uh, which uh, would have been impressive to anyone who knew uh, the pagan traditions of that time, but had very extensive and very magical ceremonies, These uh, were something that the early church fathers looked at and uh, really wanted to imitate. Uh, And um, uh, there was no room in that um, kind of structure, marginalizing women and promoting Jesus as a sole operator. There was no room in that um, central thesis for Uh, a a very strong spiritual partnership between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. 
and the fact that Jesus and, and Mary demonstrated a new kind of partnership between advanced beings, the fact that they were anchoring the energy of love into the matrix, matrix of the earth, to lay the foundations for all future expansion of the light. The church fathers didn't understand all of that. They, they were just looking at it from a very narrow perspective indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think um, they wanted to uh, promote it, as I say, on, on a power basis. They, they were interested in power. And the more powerful they can make Jesus seem, uh, the more respect they would have as the priests of this powerful system. Okay, but, but uh, Stuart and Joanne, I'm watching the clock, but um, mm -hmm. we're going to stop here in a little bit. But, you know, I do not think it takes away from, from Jesus and the man he was and what he could do just to make him more human and to bring out these things. I don't think it takes away from him at all. No, I agree with you c completely. Uh, uh, and it's um, that's the thing some people find very hard to grasp, you know. It they really don't is. want him to be human. They no, uh, they've got used to the idea of him being a godlike being. But how can we possibly following follow a totally godlike being who had no problems, who never needed any support? How can you follow a, a being like that? Because that's when I found he was lonely. He he was he was human. He was in a human body. Mm -hmm. But Joanna, uh, you want to say anything before we go off? Um, How was the it? only thing carrying on with that conversation was that basically, obviously, um, though he was a scene, the scenes were part of the Jews. Therefore, uh, Joshua was was a Jew, and he was a rabbi. And in the Jewish tradition, uh, rabbis were married. Okay. Which is a kind of interesting one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. In fact, I think that, that many Jews would have been highly suspicious of a rabbi who wasn't married because they would have said, how can this man possibly advise us on the problems we have in family life if this man isn't married? He just doesn't know the background. Okay, I think we're going to have to let it hang right there. But I okay. will tell the, the ones listening that the answers to those questions are also in the second book. Well, we're coming up to the time we're going to have to leave. But um, I really think you, you've done a wonderful job with both of the books, organizing the material and putting it together. And it's time all of this needs to come out. Okay, but I want to tell everyone the names of the books. The first one is the Essenes, Children of the Light. The second one that just came out is The Power of the Magdala. And the authors are Stuart Wilson and Joanna Prentice. And you can get the books if you can't get them at your stores. Or if you, I know you can get them on Amazon. If not, you can call our company on the 800 line or you can go on our website and order them there. The, the uh, Website is www.ozarkmountain, and that's abbreviated. It's O Z A R K M T dot com. And if you're overseas, it's O Z A R K M T dot com. The 800 number to call is 1 800 935 0045. And we have people that can answer any of your questions. And I think you said you didn't want to have uh, direct communication with people, did you? Well, uh, they can contact us through our website. Okay. And you we have the website uh, in the second book. All right, so that's give it out. They can, they, no. they can contact us uh, through our website. Okay, give the website. The website is www.foundation4, that's F-O-R, crystalchildren.com. Oh, it's a long one. Foundation, Foundation for, for Crystal Children. For, that's F-O-R, crystalchildren.com. Yeah, because in the second book, there's also a lot about crystal children. There's a lot that's in true, these. and the new children who are just now being born. There's a lot of information in these two books. So their website is Foundation for crystalchildren.com. And this way they can contact you or they can contact us. Okay, we're coming up to the hour. 
And I really want to thank you for staying on. It's the middle of the night over there. That's okay. We're always happy to talk to you, Dolores. All right, but thanks for coming on, and I think it's been a good show. All right. And thank now you, you very much for publishing our books. And now you can go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> okay, and thank you very much, and thanks, everyone, for listening tonight. Good night. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.